afternoon and welcome uh, to today's hot talk, who's using your data, legal and criminal ways that data is exploited. My name is Dan Meseloff and I'm a partner in the Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Group at Tucker Ellis. I'm also on the board of the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association and a member of the planning committee for hot talks like this. Uh, I will be moderating today's discussion. Uh, as everyone knows, every day on social media, it's really every hour and every minute and even every second, uh, there's more and more news about how every aspect of our personal information is being used online, uh, whether we like it or not, or even whether we're aware of it or not. It seems impossible to go back to the pre-internet age, much as some of us may want to do so at times, uh, but the question remains, how do, we do, how do we move forward and continue to conduct ourselves online in as safe a manner as possible? Uh, to help us delve deeper into this issue, we have an esteemed panel of uh, cybersecurity and data privacy experts. Uh, Brian Smith, to my right, uh, has been employed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation since 2002, and he currently serves as the Assistant Special Agent in charge of the Cleveland Field Office's cyber, cyber criminal, healthcare fraud, organized crime, public corruption, technical, and white collar crime programs. Uh, previous, before that, he was a unit chief for the FBI's Financial Institution Fraud Unit, where he was responsible for the FBI's national asset forfeiture, bank fraud, identity theft, uh, intellectual property rights, money laundering, and mortgage fraud programs. Uh, in the center is Aaron Mendelson, who is the Chief Data Privacy Officer at Ingram Micro Inc., uh, a global distributor and reseller of technology products, where Aaron has responsible uh, for ensuring uh, personal data of employees, customers, resellers, and vendors um, in compliance with global data protection laws. Before joining Ingram Micro, Aaron was in private practice with Benish, where he focused on these same type of issues, data security and privacy compliance, as well as general technology and IT. And to Aaron's right is Emily Knight, who's a member of Tucker Ellis's trial department, and who is an expert uh, relating to biometric data online uh, as the next frontier of data privacy, as well as other cybersecurity and data privacy legal issues. Thank you all for uh, participating today, and uh, uh, Brian, why don't we start with you? Uh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, you know, this is one of the biggest threats that we're seeing across the board at the FBI, and I'll talk a little bit about kind of what the threat looks like, um, how we perceive it. Um, talk about who is being targeted uh, with this threat. I'm gonna I'm gonna use the term the cyber threat. Um, I know we're talking about data here, but I'm gonna speak more broadly on, on the cyber security. Um, what folks are after. Um, you know what this, what our adversaries are looking for, and then also how they're going to exploit it. Um, you know, as I said at the beginning, cyber is probably the biggest threat that, that we're facing right now, um, and we're seeing that across every single program that the FBI is responsible for. Um, it runs the gamut from our white collar arena all the way over to our national security arena. Um, and so, what's tough about it is that it's a highly technical skill set but it's being utilized to do the same things that people have been doing for hundreds and thousands of years. Very often it's to steal money, but it's just an innovative way to do that. And so what we're having to do at the Bureau, and you know, this is the, the talk that we give to private sector as well, is that you need to start bringing in two sets of skill sets, or multiple sets of skill sets here to address it. One is that cyber piece of it, uh, and understanding the technical, as technical aspect, but also understanding what I call the functional side of it. Um, and from the FBI, that's kind of, you know, we need to have security fraud experts, we need to have organized crime experts, terrorism experts, uh, counterintelligence experts who are addressing it, looking at it from the lens that they see it at, as well as then the lens that the cyber folks are looking at. Um, and so who are those adversaries? Um, well, it's kind of a spectrum that we look at it, and it goes from the hacktivists, who are kind of on, on the low level side of it, and then goes all the way over to national security actors, and then even you're talking about cyber warfare. Um, you know, there's a varying degree of severity within each of those. So you've got hacktivists who, you know, these are your folks in anonymous and those sorts of folks. A lot of what they're doing, it's a nuisance it's to embarrass people. Um, but some of the things that they're going after really have a detrimental impact on a corporation, um, on high profile individuals in the corporation. So it's not something that you can just discount um, because of it's a nuisance type thing. Uh, you've got criminal actors uh, who are out there engaging in a variety of different schemes to essentially steal money from individuals or steal PII from individuals to then use that to gain access to bank accounts and credit cards and things of that nature. 
Um, we spend a lot of our time focused on these folks, um, and they may be individuals who are engaging in this. It may be organized crime groups that are doing this, and these are organized crime groups that are here in the U.S. There's ones that are overseas that we're having the battle, as well as then the white collar arena um, of, of using cyber methods and ways <coughs> going from this cyber arena to engage in things like security fraud, um, and whether that's a market manipulation scheme or insider trading. Um, as far as how it's manifested, again, you've got, if you think back to what I said earlier, is that you've got specific skill sets that you wouldn't necessarily have a cyber guy who understands maybe the security fraud aspect. And so what we're having to do is bring that security fraud expert into the equation. And then you've got the insider threat at each of your firms, each of your companies. Um, and these are the ones that scare us the most because they, um, they know all the secrets within the company. They know where everything is stored. Um, they know what, what's of value to the company, um, and so if they're on the loose within your within your corporation, your entity, they're the ones that can cause the most damage. Um, and unfortunately, those are the folks that we're not getting the calls about very often. Um, very often, those folks, if they find them, they let them go, and then they move on to another company and do the same thing. Um, and then you would start moving into the national security arena. Um, you know, we certainly see our share of cyber terrorists. They certainly are looking for the capability to cause damage to our infrastructure, um, as well as then just to embarrass companies by you know, defacing websites and things like that. Um, and then you have our foreign adversaries. Um, you know, I'm sure you can think of probably the big people that we are very interested in these days uh, um, on the cyber arena, and they're going after not only state secrets, not only defense technologies, but they're going after um, intellectual property that you're housing in all of your companies. Um, and so you may think that you know you're an entity that oh why would the Chinese why would the Russians why would the Iranians be interested in what I do? Well, if you're making money, um, if you have a competitive advantage, they are interested in it. Um, and so we all need to think about protecting ourselves not only from the low level individuals that we kind of think about on a daily basis, but also some very sophisticated actors and be prepared should they get an interest in you, uh, what you're going to do about that. Um, as far as who is targeted, it really runs the gamut. Um, we certainly see individuals being targeted. I think all of us have probably been targeted with uh, phishing schemes. Um, I'm sure all of us in the last 20 years have gotten at least one or two Nigerian letters from Prince Abdullah of the uh, Nigerian lottery or inheriting the oil revenues from Nigeria. Uh, unfortunately, those things still work uh, if people click on those. Um, uh, so you've got individuals being targeted for that, individuals being targeted for ransomware, uh, small businesses being targeted for business email compromises or CEO fraud type schemes, um, as well as then large corporations. So, you know, the days of thinking that, you know, I'm a small entity, I'm just here in Cleveland, Ohio, I'll be under radar, and so I don't need to worry about this, um, well, those are long gone. Um, they've probably been gone for about a good seven, eight years. So this is something that we all need to think about both from a corporate perspective as well as an individual's perspective. So the things that they are after are things like PII, financial information, bank accounts, that sort of thing. This you know, all makes sense to us. But they're also looking for our emails. They want to know, you know, certainly with a corporation, who's got, who holds the power within the corporation? Who has access to most of the data in the corporation? What's the relationship there? And if they're engaged in some campaign to maybe discredit you know, an agency or an individual or a company, um, they're going to use those emails to, uh, to meet their, uh, meet their uh, ends. Um, John Podesta is a very good example of someone who did that to somebody and got their email on and, and sent that out to everybody for everybody to see. So we have to be concerned personally what can be done with that information. Um, nonprofits are targeted. So again, it really runs the gamut across the board as far as who's going to be targeted for these types of things. Um, there's a variety of schemes that they're using. I think I went through a couple of those, BEC, ransomware. Um, the thing that people are, are not really protecting themselves again against is some of the things like our business practices, things that give us a competitive advantage. So very often, you know, an advantage that a company has isn't necessarily what they make, but maybe it's the efficiencies and the business processes that they have within a corporation. 
And that's the difference that they have in the market. Those are the types of things that people are after. It's not just how you make that widget and what components make it into that, but it's the process that you use and whether it's securing raw materials, whether it's a proprietary software that you have within your company <laughs> to move that from A to B and go off the market. Those are the types of things that people are interested in. So one of the things that we're pushing out to, to people is, is to think about what makes me different as an individual or a corporation or a business entity? What secrets do I have and how could someone weaponize that? And the things that you have that you think someone could weaponize, those are the things that you should be protected against. Um, because you can't protect everything at the same level. So um, the, uh, the other thing that people are going after again is not only financial records in, in the scope of credit cards and PII and things like that, but also financial statements, um, sales proposals, bids that you're working on, is people are now using cyber intrusion to go into the systems to figure out what your costs are for this proposal, and lo and behold, you end up losing out to the same competitor multiple times. It's because they had your pricing structure before you headed into those negotiations. So, um, and then the financial statements, maybe it's a merger and acquisition, is now people have access to that data before it goes to the market, and now they're trading ahead of it. Um, and so that's the stuff that really scares us, is when you start taking sophisticated cyber means along with sophisticated other types of crimes and putting those together, um, because you can truly have a, a dramatic impact on the market on those. Brian, before I move on, I just, you used PII a few times. Can you please explain what that is? Uh, personally identified information, so that's social security number, date of birth. It also includes host of red things, um, you know, your address, your email address, all this sort of stuff that you can put together and make a profile out of you and then take that and use it to get credit cards. You know, usually, you know, as a consumer, we're protected in that kind of stuff, you know, because the credit card company will protect us up to a certain amount of there's unauthorized charges. One of the things that we've seen over the past three or four years is an increase in stolen identities in relation to bigger ticket items. So home equity lines of credit. So they find out who has an open home equity line of credit, they gain access to that account, they start pulling the money down. Now you're talking about 30, 40, 80, 100 thousand dollars at a time, um, and you're not protected necessarily against those. So um, we do need to do a better job of protecting that sort of information within our systems. And again, that's our home systems as well as our business. Thank you, Aaron. Sure. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Aaron Mendelson. I'm the Chief Data Privacy Officer at Ingram Micro, which is a global uh, distributor of technology products. We're a middleman between the big manufacturers and software uh, developers, Microsoft, IBM, Dell, um, Cisco, and, and then we have a huge network of over 200,000 resellers throughout the world that buy through us to sell to their end users. Oftentimes they run the stuff, they're small and medium sized enterprises that, that are the users of our products, but also big companies as well. Um, so I'm here to talk really about the corporate perspective on what this means to an organization that has 30,000 employees, 200,000 plus reseller customers. We do other types of services within, uh, within the technology lifecycle services. We do fulfillment like Amazon, does fulfillment on behalf of smaller uh, e-commerce companies. We do that as well. And then we do reverse logistics. So we buy back devices, we repair them, we refurbish them. And we deal with a whole host of issues as it pertains to data privacy and, and data security. Now my focus is primarily on the data privacy side. I work very closely with our chief information security officer. Uh, and you can't have strong privacy without strong information security in an organization. So. We have to make sure that we have the right technical controls, the organizational controls, having access uh, access controls, firewalls, uh, logical security, uh, as well as the policies and procedures to ensure that we, we protect that data properly. But my main concern is how do we comply with the global privacy laws that are rapidly evolving? Uh, you may have heard of GDPR, which is the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation that just went into enforcement a little over two weeks ago. And that impacts businesses all over the world in terms of what they do in Europe as it pertains to the individuals who they collect data on. And so as I've uh, 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 
evolved my role at Ingram Micro, I've helped to ensure that we build a program that can meet the requirements of GDPR, as well as the requirements elsewhere in the world, to ensure that we protect that data properly, and that we use it lawfully, and that we don't, uh, that it does not become susceptible to any data breach compromise, like Brian was talking, by all these bad actors that are out there trying to get to the data. Uh, one unique difference in, in what Brian was talking about, the term PII, personally identifiable information, that's largely what we consider is a U.S. construct of the definition. It's important to understand there's a difference in Europe in terms of what they consider personal data. Uh, and they use that term personal data versus our term of PII. And personal data from a European perspective is really any information about an identified or identifiable individual. And that could just be name and address. Name, address, phone number, email address. Where we tend to think of what we're trying to protect in the U.S., things that can ca cause economic harm. Again, your social security numbers, driver license number, credit card information. And that, too, needs to be protected. But as you see, that's just a small subset of the personal data that's at issue under Europe's uh, GDPR. And so we have to make sure that that data is collected lawfully, shared properly, and, and, and protected according to, uh, according to the law and in really industry best practices. Um, so what does that mean to an organization like ours? So it means having good policies, making sure that you communicate to both your, those that you're collecting data on, who are resellers, our customers, uh, our end customers, as well as our employees, our associates, our temporary employees, as to how do we collect and use their, use their data. That's done through different privacy statements, like putting that on our website, as well as internal policies that we communicate. It means having that strong data security program, <laughs> making sure that you do the blocking and tackling that's necessary to ensure that your data is, is, is protected, it's transferred properly, it's not, not a, uh, susceptible to that unauthorized access. Uh, it means uh, also having the right processes to ensure that as you develop new technologies, new solutions, that we ensure that we take these requirements into consideration. It's called privacy by design. Performing assessments as to what is the risk of the data that you want to collect and use so that we only collect what's necessary for the business purpose of what we're trying to achieve. Um, additionally, as you try to build these types of programs to protect either your organization or clients organizations, because ultimately what we want to do is, is do right by the individual whose data we're, we're, we have in, in an organization, it becomes a risk management activity. Uh, I, I, when I talk to our C-level, these issues have attention all the way up to our C-level. I was uh, Our headquarters is in Irvine, California, and I, I work remotely here from Cleveland. Uh, but I traveled to our headquarters at least once a quarter, and I was in uh, in Irvine at the beginning or at the end of May, and I, I was with our C-suite talking about these issues. Uh, and what they want to know is, well, how do you tackle this? How do you deal with this? And it's a risk management exercise. You can't be compliant 100% of the time to 100% of the standards. It's just it's just impossible. If you're a, an SME, a smaller medium enterprise, or even if you're a big organization, you would you would not be able to achieve your business purpose by being 100% compliant. So you have to pick and choose your battles and understand where do your priorities lie. Is it with your customer data? Is it with your employee data? Is it having investing heavily in information security, or is it investing in employee training? You have to understand what is your risk profile as it pertains to the data, and what is your risk in terms of addressing those activities that are needed to, to achieve your compliance purpose. And it's a spectrum. You know, GDPR and the other data protection laws that are evolving, they provide a little bit of a, of a reasonableness standard based on your organization's risk as well as your organization's uh, revenue. And, and one of the big issues with GDPR that's scaring a lot of, a lot of executives is the uh, uh, high enforcement uh, fines that are available to the governments in, in Europe, particularly what you hear is 4% of your global sales or 20 million euros, and that's a big number. Uh, but as long as you're doing, making reasonable choices, being prudent in how you develop your program, protecting the data appropriately, working with in your organization with your information security team, uh, you're, you're going to be relatively uh, compliant and, and you, you, I would say you don't risk those high high level enforcement, but nobody nobody knows for sure. So, uh, but it's important to understand and manage this as a risk within within your organization. Um, 
Additionally, transparency is key. Uh, transparency with your, your customers, transparency with your employees as to how you use that data, how you collect it. Uh, communicating uh, to, to all, chan all, all levels of the organization what is expected of them as well. Uh, when you get down to, uh, to protecting the data in your day-to-day -day activities, you rely on your employees to do the right thing. So making sure that your employees know that to treat the data that they have access to within the business that they're doing, to treat it as if, there was, if, this, as if it was their own. You don't want to, to risk that data being compromised, and so you have to train your employees, explain to your employees that this is an expectation of them, how to treat that data appropriately, how to communicate if they think something has gone wrong and where to seek help. So uh, all this helps to, to protect the data that an organization holds. And nobody has, has the magic, uh, the, the silver bullet or the magic answer here, but we're all trying to do, what we're trying to do is protect the data and make sure that it's used in, in compliance with the law and that we protect those that, that, that trust us to collect and, and use their information lawfully. <laughs> Do you want to speak about biometric data? So again, my name is Emily, and I am a member of the trial department at Tech Corrales. Now, I know a lot of you are probably wondering what in the world can this girl who has been teaching, or practicing for a hot minute, can possibly tell me about the law. And probably in almost every other area, you are exactly right, and I would have no business being up here. But luckily for me, biometric data, as Dan described it, is really a new frontier in the law. It's an emerging topic. It's not something that's been around for a while, but it is something that I put a lot of time and effort into really researching and understanding. And because of that, it is probably the only topic that I can give you some insight and some useful information on. Um, so really today, I just want to give you a brief overview of, of what biometric data is. Uh, briefly go over the regulatory landscape right now and what litigation we're seeing and then really probably what is of most interest to all of you is why this matters for you today in Ohio. Um, so what is biometric data? I feel like that's such a buzzword. We're, we're hearing it all the time now and I, I would think and hope that when you hear that word you think fingerprints, voice ID, facial recognition, retina scans and that that's definitely all part of it but it doesn't exactly capture the whole picture. Um, so fingerprints in, in that software, it's all what is known as a biometric identifier. And these are really just the distinctive measurable characteristics that are used to recognize you. And I like to think of biometric identifiers really as the information that's being collected, so that original scan of your fingerprint. But that's not exactly what biometric data is. Biometric data takes that scan and reduces the information down to an equation or an algorithm. So I think the most relatable example I can give you is your cell phone. I think at this point we all have iPhones that you use your finger to gain entry to. And when you first set that up, you had to put your finger on it and it took a picture scan of your fingerprint. That's the biometric identifier. But that's not actually what your iPhone is storing and using every time you try to gain entry to your phone. It actually reduces that down to an equation that's based off of the curvature of your finger, the spaces in between the lines, the thickness, the length, and that's the information that it's actually storing. And we're seeing companies, in addition to Apple, across industries starting to incorporate this technology into, into their day-to-day -day operations. I think um, really common area is a lot of businesses or are transferring their time clocking from a traditional punch in punch out to a fingerprint and this is really because it eliminates risk like buddy punching and other manipulative practices it's also become really common for building security so a lot of companies are eliminating fobs or key cards and replacing them with fingerprints to gain access into a building or a particular part of the building and again really this is it does provide an increased level of security. Your fingerprint is unique to you and no one else has it. But with that increased level of security comes a lot more risk. Um, because it is so unique to you, it's, it's irreplaceable. If that is ever lost or stolen, there is literally nothing that you can do about that. So in response to this increased risk, some states have started to enact different regu reg regulations and statutes to kind of address it and try to minimize this risk. Right now, Ohio does not address biometric data. It doesn't fall within any of its data breach notification statutes. 
And I'm not aware of any legislation right now that's coming down the pipeline. None of the states in the Sixth Circuit also address biometric data explicitly right now. Really, the um, three biggest players are Texas, Illinois, and Washington. They have all enacted statutes that explicitly regulate a coll the collection and use of biometric data. There are differences between each, each of the three statutes, but for the most part, they all aim to achieve the same goal, and they do it in, in pretty similar manners. I don't want to dive too deep into the details since they're not directly applicable to us here in Ohio. Um, but just generally, the statutes require some level of notice and consent before you collect and use this sort of data. They all have some sort of restrictions on sharing or disclosing this data to third parties, and they all plainly prohibit profiting from it. So you can't collect your employee's fingerprints, for an example, and then go sell them to a third party. Uh, all of these statutes require that you protect this data in at least the same manner that you're protecting your other, other personal and confidential information. And they all come, carry with them some significant penalties. I do think that it is worth noting that the Illinois statute is the only one that creates a private right of action. So individuals or what we're seeing more of collectively, individuals can get together and sue companies, typically their employer, alleging a violation of the Illinois statute, which is known as the Biometric Information Privacy Act. And at this point, there have been some pretty significant settlements under this statute. Um, I'm aware of a case against LA Tan where they settled for over a million dollars. And there was another settlement with Rowdy Supermarkets, which is associated with like Kroger's and Mariano's, and that settlement was for over $10 million. So even though this hasn't really been around for a long time, the penalties that are coming with it are, are quite significant. Um, additionally, there isn't any federal legislation right now that addresses biometric data. But depending on how you use it in your practices and procedures, you can fall, in, fall within the jurisdiction of the FTC. The, specifically, the FTC has said that if you are collecting this data, regardless of whether your state has a statute or not, and you are promising a certain level of security, but you fail to deliver on that, then they, they can initiate an action as an unfair and deceptive practice. So just something to keep in mind. And also, I know we touched on this before, but the GDPR, so if you are collecting data from an individual who is a citizen of the European Union, you are subjecting yourself to that regulation as well. So even though there isn't an extensive regulatory landscape right now, we are really seeing an uptick in particularly class action litigation. I think in some ways you could probably categorize it as a feeding frenzy of plaintiffs who are capitalizing on what we're calling procedural or technical violations. So what I mean by this is uh, an employer might take its employee's fingerprints to use for time punching. And plaintiffs are alleging that these employers are taking them without providing sufficient notice or obtaining sufficient consent. So they're not saying that you took my data and you lost it or someone stole it. They're just saying you didn't follow the correct procedures of the Illinois statute. I think the most famous case of this is against Facebook, and it has to do with their facial recognition software. So I think we most people have Facebook at this point, and when you upload a picture, it a lot of times we'll like automatically tag someone in it or suggest who to tag in it. And it does that using its facial recognition software. So it will scan the face of the picture, reduce that information to an algorithm that Facebook then stores, and every time a picture is uploaded, it uses it to see if that's you. So a group of plaintiffs from Illinois who don't have Facebook, so they've never read the terms of service, they've never agreed to the terms of service, got together and sued Facebook, and they're like, listen, you're, you have this algorithm of my face, and I never agreed to this. You're violating my privacy rights under the Illinois statute. At this point, the best defense that we have seen, or at least the most successful defense we've seen to these types of procedural and technical violations is to challenge Article Three standing. Um, but even then, the success rate has been mixed. There are some courts that are more sympathetic to this argument and, and say, you know, just alleging a, a procedural violation is not a cognizable injury and they've dismissed the case. But there are courts, particularly the Northern District of California, which where the Facebook case is right now, 
they've rejected that defense and they've said, listen, this is this is a cognizable injury. If we didn't recognize it as an injury, we would be pretty much rendering that part of the statute useless. And they've allowed that case to proceed and it is set for a trial. Uh, like I said before, I haven't seen any, I, I'm not aware of any cases where plaintiffs are actually alleging a breach or a loss of information. But there are a few cases where companies have disclosed their biometric data to third parties without obtaining consent. And in those cases, courts are much more quick to reject any Article III standing arguments and have just pretty much said, listen, this is exactly the type of behavior that this, these statutes are meant to, to prevent. Um, but before I wrap up, I do just want to kind of bring this all back to us in Ohio. So a lot of us in the, this room, our clients are Ohio-based, and a lot of what I've talked about this far are things going on in other states. And other jurisdictions so really why does this matter to you here today um, I think the most obvious is if your client or company is collecting data of individuals that are in any of these jurisdictions or states then they will be subject to that those statutes um, if, for example Facebook did try to make an argument that they are a California company that practices all over the, the, net, the nation and again the court said well we get that but these these individuals are residents of Illinois, so the Illinois statute is going to apply. And again, with the GDPR, if you're collecting any information for citizens from the European Union, you are going to be subject to the GDPR. I think maybe where most of the exposure lies, at least for our clients here in Ohio, and is what is most interesting for you, are instances where there actually has been a breach or the data has been lost or stolen, whether negligent or by some wrongdoer. And although Ohio doesn't have a statute, the default is going to be a standard of reasonableness. So when a breach occurs and, and when a lawsuit is initiated, the court is going to look and see what steps you took to protect that data, specifically if you took reasonable steps to protect. Um, so it's going to look and feel the analysis a little bit different depending on the particular facts of, of that case, but really they're going to look and see have you, do you have a process that is identifying the known risks, a process that's thinking about anticipating or anticipated risks, and then doing something to account for those? Are you putting in safeguards to try to eliminate or at the very least reduce these risks that you have? If you're doing that, you're likely going to be okay in Ohio, at least for now, until a statute does come. Um, but I think the worst thing that you could probably do is is think that Ohio doesn't have any statutes regarding biometric data, so this is not something I have to worry about right now, and just ignore it. Because when your client does suffer a breach, because likely at some point they will, if they've done nothing, they are probably opening themselves up for a world of, of trouble. Right. Well, again, thank you all for your thoughts on your various uh, you know, perspective, uh, aspects and perspectives on cybersecurity and data privacy. You know, it's interesting hearing and listening to, the, to, to each of you. There is an individual component, you know, where each of us or many of us wear two hats. We have our individual hats where we're like, you know, how is my information, my individual information, you know, jeopardized or compromised? And also, we're lawyers. We represent others. We may, you know, be in the position to give other companies advice, their clients advice. So I'm curious whether, from the individual individual perspective, you know, what any of us sitting here can do, or advice that we might be able to give others. What would each of you recommend as one step as we sit here today, one measure to implement to protect themselves online? Uh, you know, what would you recommend? Brian? Well, so the issue that we have actually, even with that question, we get this a lot of what's the one thing you would do, and you hear people like, oh, make sure it fits strong passwords, make sure you cover the webcam on your computer, make sure you're antivirus. I mean, it's all of these things, and actually. Even starting at the beginning, that question is, if you look at it, and the issue, that, the reason that we're in this place, I think, is that some, at some point we looked at this as an IT problem. And we said, we're going to have our IT guys fix this, and we're going to build these strong firewalls, essentially you know, going back to the medieval times, we're going to build a moat around this thing, and no one's going to be able to get in. But we always find a way in. Um, and so by treating this, you know, if you look at this as a technical solution, and try and get the right software and IT infrastructure and things like that, it is a losing battle because someone's always going to figure out how to exploit it. 
the only way that I think we have an opportunity to actually beat this uh, and combat it is that if we start bringing, like I talked earlier, that functional knowledge and expertise into the equation and make this a business problem. And so when you're going out to your clients and talking to them, the business folks need to be involved in discussions with the IT folks. That you can't say, I'm gonna push this off on these guys and have them solve it because they're so smart. Um, they don't understand your business. And so we've had situations where we've gone out to, it was a chemical company, and we asked the IT guys, okay, what's the crown jewels here? What do you, what do you need to protect? And they said, it's the, it's the chemical compounds used to make our, our products. Okay? I'm an accounting major, so that sounds good to me. It makes sense. We talked to the business guys, and they said, any scientist knows how to make what we make. These, this is all public knowledge, the compounds that are being, what, for us, the better advantage that we had was the business processes that we had in place. The proprietary software that we developed in order to, to help in the interaction process. That stuff was wide open. No one was protecting that. So what you've got is you've got the IT guys focused on what they think is important. And you have the business folks saying, that doesn't matter at all. And so until you start having those conversations of cross programmatic conversations, you're not going to be able to protect it because you may be protecting something, but it doesn't has no value. Um, so to me, the biggest thing is start working together and saying, what do I have that's, that's a value? And let's work on protecting that, and whether that's encrypting it, whether it's having you know only certain individuals having access to it, whether it's changing administrative passwords and things like that, or limiting the number of administrative passwords. There's a whole host of different technical things. But until you figure out what's important, it's a, it's a losing battle. Aaron, what do you think? So I was going to bring it back more to the individual a little bit, and, and I agree with everything Brian says. Is that, I mean, you have to have that that collaboration and, and those discussions within your organization. And sort of building on that is, is knowing who has your data as an individual and, and reading those privacy disclosures. And you can you can extend that to your organization as well because. None of us do everything on our own. We use third parties, we use service providers, and oftentimes we provide them data, whether it's on our employees for payroll or for HR management or for travel, whatever the purpose is, or in, even in business data, it could be for accounting purposes or CRM systems or, or whatnot. But you have to understand who has your data and what are they doing with that. And that starts with the tr disclosures. I talked a little bit about being transparent as an organization, to tell those who we have data on, what are we doing with that data? And that was one of the big obligations under GDPR was to improve the transparency and really the readability of those privacy policies or privacy statements that exist on our websites or you get in the mail from your, your financial services firms or, or, or whatnot. But oftentimes we ignore those as a consumer, as an individual, and even I see it in, in companies when uh, I have business uh, business owners or sponsors coming to me and asking, hey, can you help with this agreement and look through what 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 is, what, are, what we need to do from a T's and C standpoint? And I'll always start, well, what are they doing? What data do they have? What is needed? How are you gonna provide that data? So I can get the understanding and, and really understand the risk and the scope of the processing. But we need to do that as individuals as it pertains to your personal, personal accounts, whether it's reading the new Facebook disclosures, Google disclosures, understanding what is it that they do with your data? You, you read about Facebook almost on a daily basis on something that they're doing, but they've had pretty decent disclosures on what they do with your personal data, with the information that you use in their service. Now they can always be better, but how often do people read those? Have, has anybody here read the full Facebook privacy statement if you're, if you're using Facebook? No, I, I mean, but go home, take, take a minute. It won't take you that long to skim through it, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and you understand how they use their data, how they use your data, how they share that data, where is it Where is it going, how is it protected, and whatnot. And we have to do that both as an individual with the data that you provide to the organizations that you're doing business with, but also if you're, you're representing your clients or you're representing your organization, understanding where does that data go and how is it being used. Emily, I thought it was fascinating what you said that we've all probably been through the exercise of having to replace your password. Your, you know, your access has your, your account has been compromised. Please replace your reset your password. But to the comment that you made, how do you reset your face or your uh, your fingerprints? What do you do? Did you burn your fingerprints? I don't know. <laughs> Get plastic surgery. I'm, um, I, I think maybe that's 
why I think that biometric data is one of the biggest threats out there right now is because what do you do if that information is exposed? I mean, if someone were to get the algorithm to my finger, my fingerprint, not only would my devices now be compromised, but any device or system that relies on it for the rest of my natural life is going to be at risk of, of being breached. And have, uh, I guess that might highlight the point that Aaron made to make sure the disclosures are there, to make sure that you read. And, and one point also, I think we, all, we may feel like David's against Goliaths in this battle, but if you have an issue, then you might need to decline. But if you don't feel like a service or an app is adequately protected, you know, it might be that, hey, I'm not going to sign up for the fingerprinting component of this because I just don't get a good vibe. I, I think that's a good point. I mean, there's a cost and convenience that we have. And so if you decide that, yeah, I'm going to let City use my fingerprint, and I'm going to let J.P. Morgan, and I'm going to let Apple, and I'm going to let all these entities, you are now releasing that information out there. <coughs> and we need to be aware of it that, yeah, it's nice if I can just touch the button and now I'm into those apps. But is it that much harder to put a password in? Um, well, we'll get into the passwords, I'm sure, at some point here. But, but, you know, there is a cost to these. I think the problem that we've had is that we've always been focused on the convenience. Um, and not thought about that cost. And again, so one of the things we're asking people to do, which is weird to hear from the FBI, is we want people to start thinking like criminals. And, and, and I say that because we want them to reverse it. What can, what can someone do? If they have ill intent, what can they do with this information? And then you can start figuring out, okay, well, where do I need to figure out whether it's been exploited or how do I protect it? But until we start thinking that way, and again, this is from a business standpoint as well as a personal standpoint, we're just choosing convenience every single time. Uh, another question, uh, and then we'll open up to the audience for questions you may have. But uh, I don't know about anybody else. I often feel overwhelmed by it all. That I feel like all I want to do is upload a picture of you know a vacation or my kids or something, and I feel like it's me against the entire population of China, Russia, North Korea. Maybe yes, maybe no. Who knows? What day to day, um, and a million others. And, and it can just feel overwhelming, and like you're almost having an error, as you said, like you're almost always going to lose, or you have to keep on top of things. So I'm curious, how do you address the, you know, what I think is a common sentiment of that, that you're fighting, you're always fighting what is never going to be a losing battle? I, I think, from my standpoint, is that <coughs> there's certainly some technical things that you can be doing, and there's some good hygiene that all of us should be doing as individuals, and, and that starts with you know, good passwords. But again, it's not your kids' names, but coming up with maybe it's an algorithm, maybe it's you're getting an app, one of those password keeper apps um, as a way to have hard passwords that you're not using across every single platform that's out there. Um, the I other thing is. I know that there are people sitting in this audience that are dying for specific information. Yeah. How, with the, the need for so many different passwords in so many different places, that are all have, you know, you can't use a lowercase here, you can't use an uppercase, you wouldn't. What is your specific practical advice for how people can create passwords and then put them someplace safe so they know what they are when they need them? So there are a couple of different apps that are out there that do a very good job of storing passwords for you. And so you have a one very complicated password that goes into it, get into that application, and then that application has the passwords for all your different websites in there. And it will, it, it's encrypted, it will have, I, we can't give recommendations as to which one people should use, but those work very well. Um, <laughs> yeah. The other thing I'll say is that, you know, personally, I don't use one of those. I have kind of an encryption and algorithm in my head based off the name of the website. And so I have a kind of a standard passphrase that I use, but based off the website and maybe where you know, number of characters in it, or the vowels and consonants, and where it fits. Like, I have it, so I know whatever website I go into, what the password's going to be, even though I don't really remember it because I have that kind of algorithm. So that's another way of not using. You know, you don't have to use one of those tools. Um, and I'll let these guys take. The other thing I would say that's it's specific and that's not technical is that very often we find out that we're victims of, of crime by doing things like reconciling our checkbooks looking at our credit card statements, and writing our credit report. So very often, you know, again, we think, oh, this is a technical solution. I need to have all this stuff, and we need to have antivirus and things like that. But those are things that anybody can do. You don't have to be a computer whiz to reconcile your checkbook, to run your credit report, and say, hey, 
I don't remember applying for this credit card. This seems odd. Look it up. So I think, again, going back to the other point of we focus on the technical side of it, there's some other things that we can just do that are good hygiene. Yeah, so, I mean, the password uh, applications that are out there, I, I don't use them either, uh, but I, I try to keep everything in my head. Occasionally, I do have to reset a password because I, I do forget it. I think that that's just human. Uh, but there are those applications out there. I would encourage you to you can Google them and read the reviews. Some of them are app-based. Some of them are, are web-based. The browsers do now have, have that functionality built in. So through like Google Chrome, you can store your passwords in a stored in an encrypted manner with you having access to it. Uh, another easy thing to do um, is turn on the dual factor authentication on any of your major uh, your, your major account, whether that's your, your Google account, your uh, Office 365 account, uh, your, your banks. Basically, what that means is that you, you need to know something and uh, have something. So. Like when you sign into to Google, it will say, "Well, this is your. You haven't signed in, or you're signing in for a new time." It'll ask. It'll send you a number, and through your text or through an email, to another email address or, or whatnot, and then you have to enter that code. So you, you need two things to get into your accounts. Using those types, uh, turning those on into your accounts, and most of the major applications, Facebook, Google, I, I know Microsoft, uh, maybe even your corporate network uses things like that, but. Uh, ha having those things enabled on your own personal accounts goes a long way because it's hard to compromise if you are sending a proprietary number to your, your mobile device to spoof that and, and get that number from, from somewhere else. Um, but those are just some of the practical things that you can do to, to help protect your own identity. Uh, putting on the, the credit freezes as well, calling the, the credit bureau so that new accounts cannot be created in your, in your name, using your social security number, that's, that's another prudent action to take. I mean, we're all fighting this battle uh, together, so if anybody else has has common sense type of, of procedures, you know, please share them here. I don't know if you have any other I have a question. Sure. Um, here. Okay, here. Um, what about uh, your data as a commodity that, you know, uh, I'll be on Amazon and then Facebook will have ads popped up for what I was just looking at on Amazon. And I mean, I just feel like anything I do, on the internet is now being bought and sold by companies, and I have no way of stopping it or doing anything against it. Um, can any of you speak to maybe things that we could do? Is it right or wrong? Is it ever going to change? It's only going to get worse. So, what are your thoughts on that? So you, your data is a commodity. You're the commodity. I mean, it, it's, it's you that, that Facebook is selling to all their advertisers. They're not making. You, you're not paying for that service. You're paying for that service in your data, but not with dollars, but with your data, so that you can be sold to. You know, with every tenth post that comes through your, your you know, your your scroll, um, there are trackers that are ad blockers that you can get to stop some of those trackers. You can disable some of the cookies that are out there. I, I read with uh, Apple last week with their uh, worldwide developer conference is building in some functionality into their devices, both I think the desktop and the mobile devices, to break some of that tracking that's out there. But you can download those. There's different browsers have different functionality. I think uh, Google's probably one of the worst because you're, you're, you're providing data through Chrome into their ecosystem. But you can turn off some of that tracking capability if you want. And if you choose, you just have to go in and, and, and identify what, what it is in terms of your settings that you want to want to have. Yes. And uh, feel free to raise your hand. You know, we'll, we'll open up the questions from the audience. Karen. Uh, so you've just destroyed my, you know, every Bond film I've ever seen where they have to cut off the guy's thumb. <laughs> 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 Just need a picture of this one. So, <laughs> not even a picture, just an equation. Yeah. <laughs> so, but how close are technology companies coming to actually creating a sensor that would actually read my genetic fingerprint so that it would be true biometrics? You know, I'm not. I I'm not aware of the science behind the biometrics data. I I've, I've researched more the legal implications behind it. Um, so. When that does happen, I'm sure that it, there will be some sort of litigation on it that will give us some direction and guidance. Well, and, and, and I should add, I mean, I think your question almost goes to some of the heart of the issue that 
how much of ourselves do we give online? Like, I almost rue the day that it gets the genetic information. How secret do you have to get before you can withhold any component of yourself from being online? You know, you want to one-up the hackers and one-up, you know, online activity, but at what point do you compromise your security altogether where they know my genetic code because that's what I need to log into Facebook in 2025, um, but then all of a sudden someone hacks into that and then there's nothing of me left. You know, that's really, I think, one of the battles here at between the good guys and the bad guys. Any other questions? Sure. Yes. So this is going to sound stupid, but I don't know how to make it more direct. If I go to Hertz and rent a car, if I flip that over and read the fine print on the back, I probably won't rent the car. But the reality is I want to rent the car, so I yeah, don't yeah. bother reading it, and I move on with my life. I get those privacy notices. I suspect if I sit down and read them, I'm not sure what I what I do next. Are you? I'm not going to be able to negotiate a change to that. So I appreciate the suggestion, and I think you're right that we're getting these inserts and we toss them or put them in our recycling bin, and we don't even think about what they tell us. But what is it that you suggest that we do with the information if we read it? And what do you suggest that we have in mind beyond paying attention to ourselves personally? when we talk to our clients. So you can choose not to, to use a service. I mean, in, in your circumstance with Hertz, you can want to rent the car, but do you need to be on Facebook? I mean, I think that's a personal decision, and, and I think you're seeing Facebook fatigue. And, and, and my peers that, that I know that have been on the service since 2005, when it first was being distributed across university campuses, have started to, to disengage from the service. I have. I personally have. I was on it for 10 years, and, and and the more I realized in terms of what they were doing, and it's not just that I think that they're doing bad things. I think their network has become so unwieldy that they can't control it. So I mean, we have to make those decisions. Is it worth it to you as an individual to share your pictures with your friends and family across the world to know that you're the product being sold to advertisers? And I felt very uncomfortable with that, and I came to that realization over like, the last six, seven months. It wasn't something that was immediate, but it's similarly, if you transact on Amazon, they're gonna know your, your purchasing history, and that's a trade-off that maybe you're willing to make, that they're gonna try to advertise to you to buy complimentary products or like products. But you have to understand that you know everything has a trade-off, like you said, and I think that's everyone's tolerance for what that trade-off is is different. And you may be able to be, feel okay with it. I'm not sharing anything on Facebook I wouldn't share in a public forum, I'm okay with that. But uh, I think you have to make those decisions on your own or with your, if you're advising a client, and it's not Facebook necessarily that you're talking about, but is that service provider doing the right thing with the data? I'll tell you, I've, I've had to stand firm on certain, on certain situations when a startup that's very immature, doesn't necessarily have the right privacy practices in place, isn't able to communicate their, their procedures or policies well, and told our business, look, you cannot do business with them. I'm sorry. Go find a more mature solution or a more enterprise-ready solution. This looks like it's just the, and they weren't willing to negotiate their T's and C's. It was a take it or leave it. I said, we're leaving it. We're going to go find I don't care how cheap it is. I mean, those are the situations that, you, that, that I'm put in pretty regularly, and you have to make those decisions. Yes. Come in and then back. This question is directed to uh, Emily. From a practitioner's standpoint, Emily, what measure of damages are we talking about in the event of a breach of a statute, for example, when you described in Illinois that requires the employer, whoever, to guard the information that they possess and the data that they have? In, in a class action, what kind of relief would a class action of petitioners would be seeking? What measure of damages, if any, if there are? And if there are no damages, what is the relief? Just from a common sense standpoint, I comes into the office and says, my data has been given to so-and-so. I don't know what to do about it. I tell him, I don't know what to do either. Uh, have you incurred any damages? No, I don't think I have. Uh, what if you do? Well, then you know you have a measure of damages. But for, for, just from my uh, practitioner's standpoint, how would you answer that question? I mean, I think in terms of non-monetary relief, there's not really much that you can do. Once that biometric data is out there, it, it's out there, and there's not much that you can do to, get to, to, to take that back. Um, I think... In terms of damages, this Facebook litigation will be really interesting to watch play out. It is because it is so publicized. I think it will kind of set the groundwork for a lot of class actions to come. But 
for guidance, there are there have been some settlements in this arena that kind of give us a little bit of an indication of what damages might look like. And in, and in both of those cases, it's been in the millions of dollars. So there was one settlement for 1.5 million, and another that I'm aware of that was uh, for 10 million dollars. So the damages. What evidence in, was submitted to get that kind of money? I'm sorry. What evidence did the petitioner or the plaintiff? provide to get that kind of money. These are the procedural and technical violations, so you're not following the the process the process is set forth in the biometric privacy or information privacy act. In, in my experience in similar comparable statutes, they, the statutes themselves, because the damages are difficult and impossible to calculate and they may not be measurable at the time the action is brought, but they may not be apparent for years to come, there statutes like that usually have you know a statutory fee. So for every breach of a thousand dollars you reach for a thousand people and drill me out a million dollars. It's not like you have to show, hey, you know, someone charged fifty dollars on my credit card, so therefore I get fifty dollars back. Usually, in those types of cases where it is difficult to to quantify, there's usually a statutory penalty, potentially in addition to uh, compensatory damages. If you say my, you know, my my credit score was shot, I had this problem getting a mortgage, so that would be in addition to the statutory penalties. Yes, in the back. Thanks. Uh, when you talk about DNA and so forth, it made me think about this idea of uh, sites like 23andMe, where people think, oh, this is really cool. I'll just send them a little saliva. They'll tell me whether I'm actually Irish or uh, I'm Hungarian. But they end up having all your health data as well. So you're giving up a whole lot more information people are than what they really think they're doing. Uh, and then my understanding is that it could possibly impact on a person in the future when they're trying to get health insurance and so forth. So, you know, what do you think about that kind of issue? Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's those are the types of things that concern us um, of moving forward. Of these, and it goes back to the people. You know, this is cool or it's convenient, um, and they're not thinking about the downstream ramifications to it. Of, if that information gets out, is that going to um, limit your ability to get health care in the future? And is now going to no longer be covered because now they've identified that I've got some hereditary gene, and so they're not going to insure me for this. Um, all because you just wanted to know whether you're actually Irish or or not. Um, so those things that, that concern us. It's also the fact that you know if you go in and you can get that data, you know. We talk about identity theft, we're pretty used to the concept of it in the terms of credit cards and things like that. But there's some some authors who've been writing about of uh, you know identity theft of you know assuming the online identity and does that become the real person? Um, and so like for example, I don't use social media, I'm not on social media for a variety of reasons, but mostly my job. Um, but if someone decided to go out there and create the profile and they got a lot of the stuff right, you're seeing more and more companies, um, financial services companies, who are engaging in online transactions with people so they never actually meet them and they're using that information to verify my identity. And if somebody can go in there and create that online identity and they've got some of the information about me from maybe, you know, they've broken a JP Morgan, I'm an account there, so they've got all the other information, they can assume me and I have no control over it. Um, and that gets to be a very scary thought, particularly then when you throw biometric data in there and health data in there. Um, so these are the things like convenience and you know the, the fact that this is an interesting thing and fun to do, but there are some downstream costs that people are just not thinking about. Uh, we want to be uh, respectful of people's time, so I'll take one more question. Okay. Uh, this is directed to the, I guess, the entire panel. Uh, Emily mentioned uh, Residents of three states have a higher degree of protection under biometric data. When, let's say, a, a citizen of the United States goes to a uh, foreign country traveling and they take an iris scan, uh, what are your comments about that? Are we just, you know, if nothing nefarious happens, great, but you're opening yourself up to what? what? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 we're, we're doing that for citizens that are coming into the United States now, too. Um, the Homeland Security is expanding their biometric data. Um, 
I guess, program for people entering and, and, and leaving the country. And there's, there's a lot of risk associated with that. If there is a breach, your retina scan is out there and, and now it's out there in another country. Um, the extent of your remedy, I'm not, I'm not sure. These statutes in Illinois and Texas and Washington are fairly new. The oldest one is from 2008, but the litigation just started within the last three or four years. So no one has, has tried to seek a, a remedy underneath any of these statutes in another country. So I'm not sure how that would look and feel, but I mean, I, I think your question is, if it's very real and that threat exists, definitely. Okay. We have some very sophisticated foreign adversaries who would use that type of information. And, you know, in the past, political pressure has kept people in line. Um, there are certain countries that we can trust more than others. Um, but as kind of the world order is kind of changing a little bit, you know, will that hold suit uh, going forward? I, you know, that's tough to say. Um, but that is a real issue, as well as the fact that if you're going to some of these foreign countries and you have uh, what the companies in these other countries require you to provide, which then they turn over to the government, is very different than what's happening here. So whereas, you know, Google or Facebook may obtain information that doesn't get turned over to the government unless there's you know valid legal process and things like that. But that may not be the case in other jurisdictions. And so that's something that we need to be aware of as citizens and as we travel the world is that the things that we're doing online in a foreign country, they know about. Thank you. Well I want to thank all three of our panelists today. This is really a very informative discussion. Um, a few quick wrap-up notes. First, don't forget to sign in uh, for CLE credit. Second, there, there is an acronym that was mentioned a few times, GDPR, it's the EU General Data Privacy Regulation. And as it happens, tomorrow morning, uh, for those of you who are interested, there's another program actually at Tucker Ellis' offices, um, 950 Main Avenue, uh, where Jill McFarland, who is one of the corporate counsel for Sherwin-Williams, she is going to be discussing how that company uh, prepared for and implemented its uh, protection measures for uh, the GDPR. We'll circulate an email to everybody here this afternoon with more information about that program uh, for anybody who's interested. And above and beyond that, and we appreciate everybody attending today, obviously cybersecurity and data privacy uh, is of increasing concern to everyone, individuals and companies alike. Uh, and to that end, the CMBA itself will be increasing its uh, programming at the end. And so workshops, seminars, et cetera, to help everyone, to help the legal community at large in Cleveland uh, prepare for cybersecurity and data privacy risks. So uh, please be sure to look out for that, you know, beginning uh, in the fall. And again, thank you all for attending. And I want to say one more quick thing. Um, these hot talks are brought in by our Thought Leadership Committee, which Dan mentioned in the beginning. Karen Giffen, who's here, is also a member of the Thought Leadership Committee. We welcome ideas for future hot talks, things you want to hear, people you want to hear speak. So Dan, Karen, myself, Becky McMahon, come to any of us. Um, afterwards today, and let us know. There's also no July hot talk, so everyone enjoy your summer. Thank you. <laughs>